Hello everybody and welcome to my session. Uh, usually when I talk about startup conferences in the early stages, I talk about what is AWS, but I expect it since, especially here in Eastern Europe, there are many people, very good developers that know quite a lot about the basics. So what I want to do today is talk to you about some best practices and how AWS can help you with that. My name is Stefan Krauser. I am a tech evangelist for Amazon Web Services. I have before been eight years at Microsoft. I consider myself a database guy. So if you have any question about databases, that's my topic. And of course, running highly scalable solutions in the cloud. That's my stuff. If you want to follow me, SKBLN uh, for Berlin. Uh, because I live in Berlin and my email address is skraus at amazon.de. So, if you create a web application today, you do this because you want to fulfill the requirements of your users. And what do users actually want? The first thing they expect is speed. Because uh, applications today, I mean, I'm uh, grown up with the modems and everything was slow by the line itself. That's not true in many cases today. You have broadband in many countries, even here it's growing pretty fast. So the application itself, the speed of the application itself is important. It needs to be always on. And that's interesting because we just heard TechCrunch. And if you are in the lucky situation, that you are mentioned on one of these big internet sites on TechCrunch or uh, InfoWeek or all of that stuff. The problem is, and the good thing is, that uh, from one day to another, the, your audience will get very big. So everybody reads about this, tries it out, and wants to check. And I always, when some company is mentioned in online media like TechCrunch, I always try, okay, are they still online? And the problem is oftentimes they're not. Why? Because the application was not scalable, was not scalable enough to have millions of users in one day. So we really need to talk about that. Of course, you need a lot of features in your application, and that's what the developer is there for. And it needs to be personalized. I mean, the mass customization idea that everybody gets a personal uh, version of your site, that everything's customizable and so on. This means that you have to uh, have the user profile of every user, that you have fast access to the user profile. And of course, to make some money out of that, uh, you need to have personalized advertisements on your site to be able to do with that. So okay, how do we do that? So what I did today is some kind of a rule book. So the idea is to say, okay, what do I need to do to fulfill these requirements? The first of all is, it sounds pretty basic, but it's you need to service all the requests that are coming in. This depends on being online. This depends on high availability. So first of all, you need to have the uh, requests from all over the world. I mean, the Ukraine is not a small country and Central and Eastern Europe is not a small region. But I talked to some people yesterday, and everybody seems to be agreeing that in most cases, you have to go global right from the start. It's not enough to say, I want to be the leading XYZ in the Ukraine, in whatever country you mentioned, not even in Germany or in France or the UK, maybe in the US. Um, so you need to go global, and if you ever dealt with the ability to be fast and to be highly available globally, it's a hard thing to do from a local data center somewhere. So what AWS provides you is global infrastructure. We have nine regions, three in the US, one in Europe, one in Australia, one in Asia, one in South America, one in Japan. And the good thing about this is all of them are working the same. So if you ever try to spin up a data center in Southeast Asia, because you have, may have some people using your application there, that's pretty hard to do if you want to do this to a local data center. But with AWS, you can have the same API, the same calls to create service in Japan or in Europe or in the US. So the next thing about this is you need to think high availability right from the start. So 
it's really not about I put one or two servers into one physical data center and then that's fine because I have high availability if something breaks down I take the other server uh, because general rule of the internet everything that can fail does fail eventually and this happens to everything this happens to communication line this happens to hard drives this happens to servers this happens to really everything so you need to have everything in your application in at least two data centers because a whole data center can eventually have some issues and so for this we have something called availability zones we don't call them data centers because some of them are so big that they are bigger than one physical data center uh, but you really need to architect your solution right from the start to run in more than one availability zone. This is the only way to be really up and running everywhere. Okay, then the next topic is DNS. DNS may not be the most interesting service in the world, but if you have www.myapplication.com and this cannot be resolved because your DNS server for some reason is not working, then all of your application is not going to be useful at all because nobody keeps track of IP addresses. So having a reliable DNS service is good and having features in the DNS service. So we have some one called Route 53 which has the interesting um, SLA of 100%. That means we this whole service is designed for 100% uptime and availability. And this is something special because most of the time you're always talking about 99.99 something availability. This is 100%. It also has some nice features like the ability to do a failover. Because if we're talking about high availability, most of the people think about, okay, what happens if my server goes down? What happens if my data center goes down? And something like that. The unfortunate fact is that in many cases, the reason for not being available is some glitch at the developer side. So they make an issue uh, in the code and then for some reason the application fails. And of course you can fail back if you do something like continuous deployment and have the ability to go back to your light, latest version easily. But what happens during the time when your application fails? You need to have a failover to another version either to an older version or to a static version. It's even better to have a static website that you can say, okay, here's my service. I don't have the interactive part of the service, okay, but still I'm online. And you can do this with a DNS service because uh, it can do a health check of your primary site. And if this health check fails, fail over to something else. So you can have your primary site in one data center so one region actually and fail over to another region or you can have your primary site interactive through a load balancer through your application servers and fail over to a static site that's hosted in the storage service in S3. Or you can even fail over from an on-premise uh, physical data center to the cloud or something like that. So this gives you really the ability to be very flexible from this point on. Okay, next step is as I said, you need to be running in at least two availability zones. So how do you do this? Usually you have a fleet of application servers, web servers mostly, and then you need to have a load balancer in front of it and then the DNS server in front of it. So first of all, um, and this is a topic I will repeat over time, try not to build stuff that's standard services. Try not to build your own load balancer. Try not to build your own queuing service and so on. Of course, you can use HA proxy and build your own load balancer, that, but this again needs to be highly available. available. So many instances that y you need to maintain, that you need to run, use the service ELB for that. And the load balancer is able to scale up and down your fleet of servers. Okay, next step is database. Well, database, that's a different topic because making a relational database like MySQL highly available, it's not the easiest thing in the world. You need to have very skilled personnel to do this. And again, it's not something that adds to your application because it's, it's standard stuff. So what you can do here is use a feature called multi-AZ. 
So if you create a MySQL database in AWS or Oracle or Microsoft SQL Server even, if you create a MySQL database, you can click and say, I want to have multi-AZ. Means I want to have a synchronous copy of my database in another data center. The effect if, if something happens to your primary data set, database, it automatically fails over to a synchronous copy in another data center, so you're still online without doing anything more to it. And it also gives you the ability to scale your database server. Scale it vertically with bigger instances and smaller instances, because you just change the instance size, it fails over to the other data center, fulfills the request, then when the original size of the instance is changed, this takes like five to 20 minutes, uh, it fails back and changes the size on the other end. Okay, it's brighter, hey, see you. <laughs> now it's gone. Okay, so high availability database. Next thing is speed. So now we're available, we are in multiple regions, we have a high available DNS servers, high available load balancer, high available database, great. Now let's talk speed. The first thing is if you're global, if you run in multiple regions, Sometimes it's not obvious where to lead the customer to. So if you have uh, customers in developing countries, like uh, some of the Eastern European countries, like India, like Southeast Asia or something, which region do you get to? Do you get to the European region? Do you get to the Asian region? Do you get to the US region? Unfortunately, that's dependent on the ISV of the user. So what's the network connectivity exactly and the communications between the user and your site? So what our DNS servers can do for you there is measure the latency. Measure the latency from the user to your application in multiple regions. And the good thing that happens there, it automatically leads the user to the fastest region. This only applies if you're multi-region, but then it's a very useful feature. Next uh, thing is usually web applications today have a lot of static content. So you have images, you ha may have videos, you have CSS files, you have JavaScript files, all of that stuff. And loading this stuff from your web server takes quite some time for the user. So it's a good idea to cache this stuff. And we have a content distribution network called CloudFront, which can help you in that. So what you essentially say is, I want to take this S3 container, so this storage container, bucket it's called, and make this available in the caching servers. So this means that when a user comes in, first of all, it hits the original source, like in the Dublin data center, and download stuff from there. But at the same time, it's cached in one of our edge locations, and the next user that comes in gets it way faster from the edge location. So this saves you some time. Interestingly enough, the content distribution network also works for dynamic content, which is not that obvious. Why would a dynamic content, which is changed on every request, benefit from this? And the reason is the optimized path between the edge location and our data center. So it's really getting faster because the user only accesses to an optimized path. And this might be also worthwhile for dynamic content. Next step of caching is the database caching. Because the database usually is the slowest part of your application and so caching as much as you can of your database content helps you. Again, you can build it your own with Elastic Cache or something, but you can use the service here. So you get a caching cluster directly with one click and then use the API directly against your database and have a fixed cache. Okay, the third idea to save on speed with databases is not to use a relational database at all. Because relational databases, like MySQL, are intended for transactional workload. But if you really don't need transactions, so if you're not transferring money from one place to the other, for instance, and you, if you don't have a complex schema, a relational database is really hard to, to scale. If you really want to fulfill lots of clicks 
to the database. That's the that's a hard part. So, if you really want to scale up, use instead uh, NoSQL database because NoSQL databases are intended for scaling out to lots of machine and fulfilling an arbitrary load. So, again, you can use MongoDB, you can use CouchDB or something, and install it on EC2. And we have great white papers that explain you how to run Mongo, how to run Redis and CouchDB on AWS, but you can also use DynamoDB, which again is a service. So the idea of DynamoDB is that you say, okay, I need to have like 50,000 uh, read operations per second and 10,000 write operations per second for my database. And that's what you provision, that's what you pay for, and then you get a, a single digit latency for all your database reads and writes. And you can scale this up to many hundred thousands of reads and write operations per second. And you would never uh, be able to do this with a relational database on site. So this really gives you the performance that you need for fast web application. It's really extremely useful for uh, customization. We talked about this before. So when a user comes in, you need to get all the data around that user to create his homepage, to create his personalized experience, and to get to the, um, to the advertisements that you want to serve to this user exactly. Because targeted advertisement is the secret today. So with DynamoDB, you can really do this in a very fast manner and really write this very fast. We have uh, customers that even write several hundred thousand transactions or write operations per second with that. Okay, next thing is scaling, scaling up. So now first thing we did is make the system high available, next thing we did is make the system fast, so next thing is how do we scale? Okay, the interesting thing is when you do cloud discussions today, people always talk about horizontal scaling, so adding more and more machines. And this makes a lot of sense, because if you architect your solution the right way, horizontal scaling is the way to go. So if you get more load, just get more web servers. If you get more transcoding jobs for your video platform, just get more transcoding servers and take this off a queue. That's great. Trouble is, in some cases, this doesn't work because there are still, unfortunately, applications which don't scale very well horizontally. And the typical example, again, is relational database. Because relational databases were never intended for scaling out. And there are also some business applications, traditional business applications, that you may or may not want to use that just don't scale well horizontally. So don't forget that you can also scale upwards and downwards. We currently have like 19 instance sizes from very tiny ones with 600 megs of RAM uh, and single core and you get like, it, it costs you only two cents per hour, so really cheap ones, to very big ones. So we have instances with 244 gigs of RAM. We have instances with 24 two terabyte local drives. And if you think about this, this makes a lot of sense to scale up and down during for, for the database or for applications that are not scala scalable horizontally. And remember that you can easily change the size also to save money. If you're consumer-oriented, it's very likely that most of the access to your system is in the evenings and during the weekend because when people are at work, they don't, are not accessing your site. If you're business-oriented, it's vice versa. So you have lots of accesses during business hours and not so much in the evenings and over the weekends. So it makes a lot of sense to plan for that and say, okay, I'm running at a bigger instance when all my users come in and running at a smaller instances during the off times because I still want to be available, but I want to go cheaper then. And this you can do with the vertical scaling. Okay, but scaling out, as I said before, if you have an architecture that scale, can scale, easily scale out through many servers, that's the best way to do. Trouble is, how do you decide when to scale up and to scale down? And how do you do this? For instance, as I mentioned before, you have something like your mentioned at TechCrunch. Then 
a few minutes or hours later, you will have like tenfold, ten times the amount of users that you had before. So you really need to have an automated process here to scale up your fleet of, of front-end servers to handle this load. And you need to have an automated process again to scale down afterwards. Because scaling up is good, but if you uh, stay at this high amount of, of machines afterward, that gets pretty expensive without the load. So scaling down again and not stop paying for, for the resources you don't need anymore is very important. And the feature we have for that is auto-scaling. So essentially what auto-scaling gives you is the ad ability to say, I want to add more instances from a prepared image that has all my stuff in it, that goes to my load balancer and so on. And do this in various ways. So you can do it manually. If you have, uh, manually usually means through API. So if you have another system that checks for, I need have too much workload, I need to scale up. I have too little workload, I need to scale down. You can do this by API calls. Uh, you can do this by schedule if you know that uh, in the morning you will have more users, you scale up before that, and in the evening you scale down the number of machines you have. And you can do this by policy, means you can use any metric from the monitoring system, which is called CloudWatch with that, like CPU, like I.O., like network bandwidth, or custom metrics that you bubble up from your code to, to use, do the scaling. So it's e easy to say, okay, Whenever my web server fleet is above 60% CPU usage for more than 10 minutes, I want to add two more instances, one in each availability zone. And whenever the usage goes below a certain amount, like 30% for half an hour, I want to reduce the number of machines because I don't need them anymore and I don't want to pay for them anymore. So this is by policy. And this also automatically rebalances itself across multiple availability zones, so you're still up and running against multiple availability zone if something bad happens to one of them. Okay. Scalability in I.O., that's a big one. Because if you have an I.O. intensive application, like again a database or a Hadoop job or something like that, uh, for a long time cloud was an issue. Why is cloud an issue? Because the persistent storage that exists, in our case it's called uh, EBS, is network attached. So you get a throughput of about 100 to 150 I.O. transactions per second, or I.O. operations per second, which is pretty slow. And it's really not scalable at all. So. That's, by the way, one of the reasons why NoSQL databases came up, because for relational databases, it's just a slow to scale. So what you instead can do today is you have a new feature called provision IOPS. And you say, OK, for this storage volume, I need 1,000 IO operations per second. I need 2,000. You can go up to 4,000 per storage volume. Um, and you can even stripe them. All of them are highly available within the availability zone uh, uh, anyway, so you can do a rate zero, stripe across them, and get, get even higher I.O. throughput. And this can get you the performance you need. Or again, use DynamoDB for the performance uh, of the database. OK, number four, simplify the architecture with services. Many people, especially if they are new to IT, are used to build all their own stuff. So they install their own Linux, they uh, customize the system, they install all the services from the database to the caching layer, to the uh, application layer, to the queuing layer, and so on and so forth. Trouble is, all of that does not add to your business value. What adds to your business value is the code that's really specific to you, to your application, to your service. So you should really focus yourself and your developers on something that generates value for your startup and get away with all the stuff that's standard, that everybody does. So really get from a 30% your business, 70% uh, 
heavy lifting of standard stuff to the opposite side. You still have to do some maintenance and monitoring and so on, but still you really want to get away with the standard stuff as much as you can. So what we do for you is we do all the physical infrastructure. We do data centers, power cooling, networking, virtualization, physical security of the stuff and so on and so forth. This is nice. But we can also add more services to it. So I talked already about the relational database service and DynamoDB, so two of the database services we have. You really don't want to install your own database. You really don't want to manage, do backups, do high availability, do scaling with database services. With these services, you can really easily get this out of the box and only have to deal with the API and, and talk to these databases. But the same goes for other services like queuing. So if you have a front-end system where web front-end servers come in and then back-end jobs, typical example would be audio, video, image transcoding. So users upload their videos, upload their images, upload their, their audio files and something. Then you, of course, have to generate metadata, generate various sizes of these uh, images or videos, transcode them for various devices, and so on and so forth. Or same goes if you're doing e-commerce. You have the front-end shop system and you have the back-end ordering back-end system, and so on. So between the two, you need to decouple it. You never want to have this in one server, so you need to decouple it, and decoupling is usually done by a queuing service. And of course, you can uh, install RapidMQ and create a queuing cluster yourself, but I would recommend against it and use SQS, the queuing service we provide, to uh, have this as a service layer and not deal with it anyway. Same goes for workflows. Workflow for me is machine-to-machine -machine communication about various steps. Same goes to search engine. Every uh, website today needs a search engine. So you can install your own Elasticsearch cluster, of course, but you can also use CloudSearch uh, for that. Elastic MapReduce, if you uh, want to do uh, log analysis with Hadoop, do it with EMR because that's really easy to do. You can create a cluster, a Hadoop cluster within minutes, and then again shut it down after you're done with your analytics. Okay, automation. Automation is the biggest one. So. There are many people that say you should never touch a production instance. And I definitely don't say server, I say instance, because you can think of them as a transient state. So it's something you start up with your code, with your application, run it for some time, and then when the next version comes in, will be replaced by a new server. So everything needs to be automated through the API. You can use any programming language you like, if it's Windows with .NET and uh, PowerShell, if it's Linux with Java, if it's mobile or something. Automate everything. Then use automation systems like Opsworks, which is chef-based, CloudFormation, which is JSON-based, or Elastic Beanstalk, which is a platform as a service service, so that you have a repeatable infrastructure that you can redeploy, that you can, your infrastructure also needs to go to your source code control system. So you can see the difference between the old version and the new version also from the infrastructure perspective. And you can do this easily with these systems. Then you need to bootstrap, so every server or every instance that you start has your code on it, then pulls the new version from GitHub, goes to a management server that says, okay, I'm here, I'm ready to take the load, will be included in a load balancer, will work, and same goes the other way around. And then auto-scaling to scale up and down in CloudWatch to monitor the whole thing. Okay, leverage you need properties. I talked about instance types already, but one thing that's important to me is pricing. Most people start with on-demand instances with AWS, which is great because you pay by the hour and as soon as you stop using them, as soon as you shut them down, you don't pay anymore. But if you really want to have it for a longer time, go reserved instances because this can save you up to 70% of the money by a longer reservation. Or use spot instances. Spot instance means you can get unutilized capacity at, or data centers at a very low price, down to 10% of the original price of the instances. But you only get them at the time 
when we have ca a capacity available. So you get them when the price you bid is uh, higher than the original spot price. You get the instances, they spun up, and as soon as the spot guys goes above your bidding price, you were taking away the instances. But this is good for batch workloads and can really save you a lot of money. Okay, last thing I want to talk about is if you're doing anything that needs uh, network interaction between individual servers, so like HPC jobs or something, go for the network optimized instances because they give you a 10 gig ethernet connection between all the instances in your HPC cluster so you really get the interactivity that you need for that. Okay, this was my rule book. So service or web request, so be available, be fast, be scalable. Don't deal with stuff that's standard, that's not adding to your business value. Automate everything and leverage unique cloud property. So in the end, we got elastic capacity, we got high availability, we get uh, automated operations, and we get storage big data analytics in a fast way to be able to do this. So that was it for me, some resources. I think all the presentations will be downloadable eventually. Thank you, and I will be in the green area down there after the session, and if you wanna meet me, feel free to do so. Thank you.